Hi everyone, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On December 1st, 2022, the Mendoza Criminal Court was filled with tension as everyone waited in suspense. The air was thick with anticipation, and all eyes were on a 32-year-old woman sitting on the defendant's bench. She wore a black dress, adorned with a necklace of white beads. Her face was calm and showed no sign of emotion, while her eyes held only composure and self-control. She was bracing herself for the judgment that would decide her future and potentially make history. This wasn't just any woman. Everyone in the room had known her for years. Yet now, they were grappling with a mystery they could barely comprehend. The sound of the judge's footsteps echoed through the courtroom like the pounding of a drum, intensifying the tension in the room. It felt as if every step was being heard and felt by everyone there. This moment was not just about her fate, but also about uncovering the truth that had stayed hidden for far too long. Behind this woman was a story, one as puzzling as she was. The trial wasn't just about her, but about understanding the details of a real crime that had baffled everyone. For those involved, the case had become a challenge unlike any other. Manato, a small town nestled among the hills and valleys of Mendoza, Argentina, is a peaceful place. In the autumn, nature shows off its vibrant colors. The streets are covered in golden leaves, and the mountain tops glow with shades of orange and red. In this close-knit town, everyone knows each other well. People share not just their happiness but also their troubles, and they stand by one another through tough times. Major events are celebrated as a community. It was in this quiet, hidden town that a love story unfolded. A romance between Rolando Angelino and Karen Uvo that would later send shockwaves through Monato and all of Argentina. As the town stood still, wrapped in the beauty of autumn, the lives of these two young people became forever linked. Rolando Angelino, a man with a captivating charm, had a way of drawing people in. So when he crossed paths with Karen Uvo, it was impossible for him not to notice her. Karen was full of life, with a fire in her eyes and an energy that could light up a room. Her passion for living immediately captured Rolando's heart. They had so much in common, similar goals, shared dreams and an unquenchable drive to achieve more. Their encounter felt like fate, giving them the opportunity to find real happiness. In each other they finally discovered what they had been searching for in others for so long. In 2016, Rolando and Karen took a major step. They moved in together and opened their own business, a small warehouse located right inside their home. Karen, with her knack for detail, created a welcoming sign in the window, inviting customers in. Next to it, lists of items for sale were carefully posted. This little shop became their pride and joy, a cozy corner of the world they could call their own. The people of Monato were fascinated by this couple. There was a certain admiration for how they worked so hard and achieved so much. While many in town had known Karen since she was a child, Rolanda remained something of a mystery. People knew only one thing, that he came from Bolivia. Beyond that, no one knew much about his past. Rolando didn't just run the business with Karen, he also worked at the fair in Galen, where he sold wholesale fruit. Together they seemed unstoppable. Looking at them, it was as if they had carved out a little piece of paradise for themselves. Their life appeared to be perfect, hardworking, successful and full of promise. But even the strongest, most loving relationships can be tested. One day, Rolando was shocked to find Karen in a car with another man. His reaction was immediate as anger took over. In a fit of rage, he nearly tore apart the car's interior. The image of their happiness crumbled in just a few minutes. Yet, after the initial shock, Rolando made the difficult decision to forgive Karen and give their relationship another chance. In the eyes of everyone around them, they still appeared to be the perfect couple, capable of facing any challenge together. Rolando Angelino remained somewhat of a mystery, Born in Bolivia in 1987, many details about his life, including the exact time he arrived in Argentina, were unclear. As the eldest of seven children, Rolando grew up understanding the importance of family and the value of hard work. His dream was simple yet powerful, to have a happy family filled with laughter and joy. In his youth, 
Rolando had a relationship with Carolina Chavez and together they had a son. Although their relationship faced its share of challenges, they managed to maintain a positive connection. Later in his life, Soledad Guardio entered the picture, and she gave birth to Rolando's second son, Elias. While things didn't work out romantically with Soledad either, Rolando was always a dedicated father. He stayed in touch and maintained a close relationship with both his children and their mothers. Rolando was known for being physically active and kept himself fit through sports, particularly by playing soccer on a local team. People who knew him described him as kind and incredibly hard-working. His neighbors liked him, and he had a certain charm in social situations that made him stand out. Karen, on the other hand, was born on March 30th, 1990. She spent her childhood and youth in the same house in Manato, where she and Rolando would later live and run their business. Karen was well known in the community, admired for her friendly and outgoing personality. Much like Rolando, Karen dreamed of a happy, loving family with a devoted partner by her side. But the path to finding that happiness wasn't easy. Before meeting Rolando, Karen had already been through a significant relationship. She had two beautiful daughters, one of whom was fathered by her former partner, Rul Oa. In 2013, Karen married Rul, but their marriage began to fall apart over time. According to Rule, financial struggles played a large part in the tension between them. Feeling the pressure of their difficult situation, Rule made a drastic decision. Under the guise of running an errand to buy something important, he left the city, fleeing abroad. Rule took several buses, making it difficult for anyone to track him down, and he cut off all attempts to reconnect with his family. By the summer of 2019, Karen and Rolando's life had settled into a rhythm, and they had many hopes for the future. One day in July, nine-year-old Elias, Rolando's son, came to stay with them. They had planned to spend time together, but everything took a tragic turn. On the morning of July 12th, 2019, Rolando went to check on Elias before leaving for work. He quickly realized that something was wrong. Elias wasn't feeling well. Without hesitation, Rolando decided to take his son to the children's hospital to see a pediatrician. When they arrived, the situation escalated quickly. After examining Elias, doctors determined that his condition was far more serious than anyone had expected. He was immediately moved to the intensive care unit. Despite the efforts of the medical team, young Elias passed away shortly after arriving at the hospital. The loss was sudden and devastating. What made the tragedy even harder to comprehend was that Elias had seemed perfectly healthy when he left home. There were no signs of illness, no symptoms to raise concern. Both before and after he arrived at his father's house, he had appeared to be in good health. His sudden death left everyone with more questions than answers, adding another layer of mystery to an already complicated story. The medical report following Elias's death was devastating. It concluded that Elias had died from third-degree poisoning, which led to multi-organ failure and cerebral thrombosis. This diagnosis left his parents in shock and confusion, as their son had seemed completely healthy and active, only to suddenly succumb to an unexplained illness. In their professional responsibility, the doctors insisted on conducting a thorough forensic medical examination to uncover the cause of death. However, Elias's mother and grandmother, paralyzed by grief, refused the procedure. Karen suggested cremating the boy's body, but Elias's mother refused this as well, preferring instead to bury her son in a private cemetery where she could visit his grave and lay flowers. The death of Elias was a heartbreaking blow to Rolando. The sudden loss of his youngest son shattered him, leaving him devastated. Through it all, Karen was a constant source of comfort. She stayed by his side, taking care of their business and supporting Rolando through his grief. Her dedication helped him slowly begin to heal from the pain. Sixteen months after the tragedy, Rolando felt ready to take a big step forward. He proposed to Karen, and the couple got married. Rolando was certain that Karen would always be by his side, and they could continue building their life together. However, their happiness was short-lived. On February 6th, 2022, Karen returned home after visiting a beauty salon and working out at the gym. When she got back, she noticed that Rolando wasn't feeling well. He was suffering from serious health problems. The next day, February 7th, things took a sudden turn for the worse. Karen came home to find a medical ambulance outside. Rolando, 
then 35 years old, had fallen seriously ill after vomiting uncontrollably. He collapsed in the living room and their housekeeper had called for emergency medical help. When the paramedics arrived, they allowed Karen to see Rolando before he was taken to the Santa Maria clinic. His condition had already become critical. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, Rolando passed away on February 9th, just two days after becoming ill. The cause of his death was determined to be severe poisoning. Given that Rolando had always been a healthy, active man who played sports, the medical team found his sudden death highly suspicious. The doctors began to ask Karen questions. She revealed that Rolando had been taking medication to treat dark spots on his skin. To the specialists, this information seemed suspicious. Further tests were conducted, and they found a significant amount of calcium oxalate crystals in Rolando's system, an indicator of ethylene glycol poisoning. Ethylene glycol is the main ingredient in car antifreeze, a toxic substance that can cause fatal poisoning. The strange circumstances surrounding Rolando's sudden and unexpected death prompted an immediate investigation by authorities. The prosecutor's office took up the case as a top priority. Investigators focused on the neighborhood where Rolando and Karen had lived, interviewing neighbors who could provide any insight. Several neighbors reported that Karen had frequently given Rolando an unknown medication. They also mentioned that Karen would sometimes go to parties without Rolando, raising suspicions about the nature of their relationship. Questions began to arise not only about Rolando's death, but also about the mysterious death of his son, Elikas. Investigators started to explore the possibility that Karen had been involved in both deaths. Some speculated that perhaps Karen didn't intend to kill Rolando, but only wanted to sedate him temporarily. However, the evidence gathered by the Technology Crimes Unit ruled out this theory. The investigation continued, and forensic tests were requested to gather more information. Karen, now the widow, was subjected to thorough questioning by the police. As they dug deeper into her story, inconsistencies began to emerge during her interrogations. Detectives pressed Karen to reveal the substance she had given to Rolando before his death, but her answers only raised more suspicions. Karen claimed that the substance she had given Rolando was nothing more than a skin blemish remedy, which she administered through an IV. However, when investigators asked her to provide a vial of the solution, Karen responded that the housekeeper had already thrown it away. Investigators then interviewed the housekeeper, Claudia Cortez, who denied Karen's statement about discarding the vial. Claudia also revealed that she had overheard a conversation between Karen and Rolando, where Rolando voiced concerns and dissatisfaction about the medication Karen had been giving him. As the investigation progressed, Karen was detained, and her cell phone was seized for examination. The news of Rolando's sudden death left his family, friends, and soccer teammates in shock. For those who frequented the couple's warehouse or knew them in the community, the events were equally baffling. Nobody could make sense of why or how the father of the family had passed so suddenly. Rule, Karen's ex-husband, was especially surprised when he heard rumors suggesting that Rolando may have been poisoned. He stated that, during their time together, Karen had always been loving and non-violent toward him. However, after investigators analyzed Karen's phone, the situation became much clearer. They found that Karen had searched online for the deadliest poisons and instructions on how to delete search history. Furthermore, records showed that she had placed two online orders for ethylene glycol, a toxic substance. Ethylene glycol, according to the Agency for Toxic Substances and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, is a synthetic chemical commonly used in antifreeze. It is odorless, has a sweet taste, and is extremely harmful to humans. Armed with the results of the forensic examination and all of this incriminating information, the prosecutor's office formally charged Karen with intentionally poisoning Rolando by mixing the poisonous substance with orange juice. This concoction severely compromised Rolando's health, ultimately leading to his death. The series of tragic events surrounding the Aquino family did not end there. By mid-February, with mounting evidence against Karen, an aggravated murder charge was officially filed. However, suspicions had also begun to rise regarding the death of Rolando's nine-year-old son, Elias, prompting a new investigation into the boy's passing. 
the prosecutor's office decided to delve deeper into Elias's medical history after Karen had previously claimed that Elias was completely healthy until he suddenly fell into a coma while at his father's home. The boy's death certificate listed multi-organ failure and cerebral thrombosis as the causes of death, but investigators remained skeptical. They questioned how a healthy nine-year-old could have died from such conditions, especially with no prior signs of illness. Determined to find answers, the prosecutor's office looked into any potential purchases of ethylene glycol around the time of Elias's death. They received confirmation that Karen had bought the poison on July 2, 2019, shortly before Elias arrived at the Aquino household. Further details from Elias's relatives revealed that Karen had strongly advocated for cremating the boy's body after his death, but his biological mother refused and opted to bury her son instead. This insistence on cremation raised further suspicions. With all of this damning evidence, prosecutor Claudia Rios filed additional aggravated murder charges against Karen on March 4th, this time related to Elias's death by poisoning. On March 14th, a judge ordered that Karen remain in pre-trial detention, despite her attempts to appeal the decision. The judge ruled that Karen should stay behind bars until her trial, which was a crucial step in seeking justice for both Rolando and Elias. Ten months later, the highly anticipated trial finally began in the Mendoza Criminal Court, drawing the attention of both the media and the public. On November 28, 2022, the nationwide trial of Karen Uvo commenced. She faced two indictments, one for the poisoning death of her husband Rolando, and another for the tragic death of nine-year-old Elias. This trial would be pivotal in uncovering the dark and complex truth behind the shocking events that had unfolded. The trial for Karen Uvo's involvement in the deaths of Rolando and his son Elias began with two primary charges. The first, led by prosecutor Fernando Guto, focused on the murder of Elias, while the second, handled by prosecutor Claudia Rios, addressed Rolando's death. From the onset, the trial attracted considerable attention, especially when Rolando's eldest son, 15-year-old Javier Aquino, appeared as a plaintiff, represented by legal counsel. Prosecutor Guto argued that Karen had poisoned both Elias and Rolando by mixing ethylene glycol with orange juice, which led to their severe poisoning and eventual deaths. He outlined a timeline in which Elias was killed first, followed by his father. Karen's defense team, however, vigorously disputed these claims, seeking to dismantle the prosecution's narrative. They contended that Rolando had been abusive and violent toward Karen, and that there was no substantial evidence to link her to the poisonings. The defense also questioned why Karen would have killed Elias, pointing out that the child posed no threat to her and that she had no motive to harm him. Karen's lawyer also stressed that Karen was already financially secure, as the house, cars and business were solely in her name. Therefore, they argued, she had no reason to kill either Elias or Rolando for financial gain. Additionally, the defense claimed that the alleged ethylene glycol purchases made from her phone could have been manipulated by someone else. They argued that there was no direct proof Karen had searched for information on poisons, dismissing the claim as implausible. In an attempt to sow doubt, the defense implied that someone might have hacked into Karen's account to make the purchases. Karen herself testified that she was not at home on February 6th when Rolando began feeling ill, suggesting that she had an alibi. Known to the media as the Gumalon Poisoner, Karen was given a chance to speak after the initial trial proceedings. With passion, she denied the accusations, stating that she was being wrongfully blamed for a heinous crime she didn't commit. Karen expressed how painful it was to endure this situation, especially as a mother of two young daughters. As the trial moved forward, witness testimonies provided further insight into the case. Prosecutor Guta questioned Karen directly about whether she had suggested cremating Elias's body. Karen vehemently denied this, asserting that she had never made such a suggestion, and that the decision wasn't hers to make. However, the prosecution brought forward witnesses, including relatives of the deceased, to provide additional details. One of the key witnesses was Soledad, Elias's mother, who shared her side of the story. She told the court that after Elias's death, Rolando had informed her that Karen had suggested cremation so that both families could keep some of Elias's ashes. Soledad was uncomfortable with the idea and firmly rejected it. Soledad also shared an emotional recollection of a conversation she had with Rolando at the cemetery after their son's burial, 
according to Soledad, Rolando mentioned that Karen had been growing increasingly jealous and possessive. This jealousy strained their relationship to the point where Karen and Rolando slept in separate beds. Soledad's testimony added a new layer to the case, suggesting that the relationship between Karen and Rolando had been deteriorating long before his death. The prosecution presented this as evidence of Karen's possible motive, linking her jealousy and dissatisfaction with her husband to the tragic events that followed. Another witness called to the stand was Carolina, the mother of Rolando's first child. She confirmed that Rolando had mentioned to her that he and Karen were no longer sharing a bed. Although Carolina didn't have direct interactions with Karen, her testimony corroborated Soledad's account of the troubled relationship. These testimonies painted a picture of a relationship filled with underlying tensions and emotional conflicts, further complicating Karen's defense. As the trial continued, the prosecution aimed to strengthen their case by focusing on these personal details, hoping to establish a clear motive and solidify the accusations against Karen. The courtroom remained tense as the trial progressed, with both sides fighting to uncover the truth behind the tragic deaths of Elias and Rolando. On the morning of February 8th, Karen called Carolina, Rolando's former partner, to inform her that Rolando was seriously ill and had been hospitalized. Karen explained that Rolando had probably taken some medication, which was making him feel unwell. She also mentioned that she suspected Rolando might be seeing another woman and asked Carolina to help unlock his cell phone. Carolina was shocked to hear about Rolando's condition, as they had seen each other just days earlier and he had appeared perfectly healthy. When Carolina arrived at the hospital, Karen was already there and had gone to speak with the doctors. Carolina, however, wasn't allowed inside and was left waiting. As she was leaving the hospital, Karen told her that everyone had already left, which raised Carolina's suspicions. Carolina then approached the hospital staff for more information, and a doctor informed her that Rolando had lost consciousness and wasn't responding to treatment. Concerned, Carolina spoke to the hospital secretary to complain and get more answers. During a conversation with Karen, she was told that Rolando had taken medication for skin blemishes and had suffered an allergic reaction. Karen also claimed that the medication bottle was no longer available because the housekeeper had thrown it away. These details only deepened the mystery surrounding Rolando's condition and death. As the trial progressed, the focus shifted to medical experts and forensic evidence. Doctors and specialists took the stand to present their findings, shedding light on aspects of the case that had previously gone unnoticed. Dr. Ivana Marinelli, a pediatrician at the hospital where Elias was treated in July 2019, provided crucial testimony. She described how Elias had been brought in with severe breathing difficulties and required immediate intubation. A CT scan revealed a deep cerebral thrombosis, and Elias was placed in intensive care. Dr. Marinelli explained that the symptoms Elias exhibited, including impaired consciousness, restlessness and eventual coma, were consistent with ethylene glycol poisoning. This poisoning also led to a blood clot.